Okay, quickly, uh, Dr. Fatirivi, we're just okay. trying to so round off on to that. Yes. that. Okay, you need to know your breast, right? If you see anything abnormal, it's time to cry out mm -hmm. and actually get to a specialist, right? Get to a specialist, mm -hmm. not someone giving you antibiotics when you have some abnormality in your breast. Mm -hmm. Yes, we need to empower people to actually know what to look out for. So basically, on the 10th day of your cycle, your breasts are less um, you know, tender, tender and they're less painful. So you could actually go either, some say, in a circular pattern, right? Then you end up in the nipple. Or you could go up, down, you know, lie down, raise up your hands, look at yourself in front of the mirror, lie down, check out for any lumps, go into the armpit. It's your breast. So you could spend as lo much as, you know, time. <laughs> as much time as you want yeah. with it. So one of my teachers said humorously that even men can help women examine their breasts, right? Okay, so it's about looking out Intimacy, for, right? you know, their something changes. different. Yes. And regularly too. Yes. Okay, so, now, let, okay. let, let, let's come okay. to... to Abigail, when we talk about cancer, some people say it's just a death Killer. sentence. That, yeah. There's no, there's no remedy, yeah. and the stigma too. Yeah. I've seen some people driven into, you know, the background Especially and hiding, yes. hiding themselves. What made the difference for you? What's your experience? Okay, first of all, um, my mother blazed the trail in that my mother had terminal cancer four times. Four times the doctors gathered us together to say that this woman is going to die in six months. Four times the woman said, I ain't going nowhere. <laughs> My mother said there's no doctor that's going to tell her when she's going to go. She will check out when she's good and ready. So she lived for 33 years after her last terminal diagnosis. After the 30, last one? Yes, 33 years. Sadly, I lost her to um, leukemia five months before I was diagnosed with cancer myself. And it was actually quite interesting because I'd had a mammogram. I was very breast aware because my mother had cancer. So I'd go every single year for, mm -hmm. um, uh, for my mammogram. And I'd done a mammogram, but I had very dense breasts. And something was still niggling me that, go and check this thing. I had a mammogram done here. And I was going to the UK for holiday. So I just said, let me just do another mammogram. And two weeks before I traveled, I was standing in front of the mirror and looking at my breasts. And something said, if you had breast cancer, what would you do? I made the decision that day I would take both breasts off. I went off to the UK, went for a mammogram, which I was very used to because I was going yearly, but for some reason I was really, really nervous. I went in, they did the mammogram, and they did enlargement of the mammogram, and the radiographer said, there's something about that right breast, I'm not sure, can we do an ultrasound? Hmm. We now did the ultrasound, then she said, oh, I can see some things I'm not sure about. Can we do a biopsy? And immediately they did biopsies on both sides. The following morning I get a phone call from the breast surgeon, not even from the hospital. He introduced himself and said, well actually I understand you want to go back to Nigeria. It's my day off, but I need to see you before you go. You can come to my house. And I thought, whoa, if an English doctor is asking you to come to your house, it's not for a cup of tea, I don't think. Exactly. You know? So <laughs> off I went to his house and he sat me down and says, I have good news and I have bad news. Which do you want first? I said, give me the bad news. He said, the bad news is you have cancer. The good news is we think we got it early. I said, take them off. He was like, oh, but what are you talking about? We can do this. I said, no, take them off. How quickly can we do it? Five days later, I went in for the double mastectomy. Everything seemed to have gone well. I came out of theater and I was eating my dinner. I cleared everything on the plate because I hadn't eaten for quite a while. Cleared everything on the plate. Next thing we noticed that blood was dripping and my, my chest was swelling and blood was dripping on my sheets and we're like, uh oh, something seems to have gone. Uh, some, maybe a, a blood vessel has, has undone or something. Went back into theater, that's with a plate with a whole tray full of food in my belly. Yeah? <laughs> Went back into theater, came back out and I couldn't breathe. They discovered my lungs had collapsed. I needed a blood transfusion. And as I, as, I, as I was in and out of consciousness, I remember I had what I can only say was like, a bit like a visiony kind of thing. And I was walking through a tunnel and it was blood everywhere. And they were like, little, you know, computer game demons, they're like jumping around everywhere. Then suddenly it started raining, like really bright rain. And as it was dropping, the blood was clearing, and I found myself standing by a stream. And what came to mind was Psalm 23. Although you walk through the valley of shadow of death, yes. he leads me by still waters. I knew I was going to be fine. My recovery was very, 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 very fast. It was, the doctors were shocked at the speed of recovery. Because I understood now I had a purpose. I stayed away from negativity. When my family had got the diagnosis, one or two family members were crying quite a lot. And I would say, look, please, if you're going to go and cry, finish crying before you come back to me. Because you need to remain positive. You, 
if you're going to, you, if, you're, if you're fighting cancer, you cannot be angry at people. Anger is like poison, it, it eats away at your soul. You have to surround yourself with happiness because happiness is medically proven to produce endorphins and endorphins are healing hormones. So you find if you surround yourself with happiness and positivity, then you can fight the battle. If you're carrying so much bitterness, your hands aren't free to fight. So it's so important that we're really, really positive. When, when I got back to Nigeria, we decided, let's have a look and see the role, the, what is the role of a cancer patient in Nigeria. We went around a couple of the teaching hospitals. We were depressed. We said, wow, people are ashamed. Why should anybody be ashamed of something they didn't cause for themselves? Even if they caused it, why should you be ashamed? People say, oh, we want volunteers to come and speak. If I come out and speak, what happens if my boss is here and they won't send me on training because they assume I'm going to die? If you're going to screen me, mass, you do mass screening, who's going to pay for my treatment when you tell me I have cancer? So these are some of the challenges that we found, and we found it necessary to put together a support structure for people who are suffering from cancer. The truth will set you free. My people perish for lack of knowledge. You have to have information. Why is there stigma? Stigma comes because of fear and ignorance. We have to show that cancer can be treated. In my mother's case, it was terminal, but she lived, so it shows the power of positive thinking, the power of believing you can overcome. And we've been able to help women by giving free prosthesis, by giving out mastectomy stuff. We assist with food from a food bank. So it's so important that you look at holistically at the whole patient. That it's creating it's really, support, really important. Yes, because of course. support is very important. Very important. You mentioned something about remaining positive, mm -hmm. and remaining positive is a whole lot of uh, things you know put together mm -hmm. if you go to a teaching hospital for if a, a person has been diagnosed mm -hmm. for prostate cancer or mm -hmm. breast cancer or colon cancer and you need treatment mm -hmm. and you go to a hospital where you don't find the equipment to to carry out or they tell you it's been uh, bad for some time mm -hmm. and how do you remain positive like that <laughs> what do you think we can do in Nigeria mm -hmm. because Indeed, there's a lot of people dying from cancer, not because they don't want to live mm. or because they're not positive in, no, in, in their minds, but there is just no treatment support, you know, adequate enough for everybody. How do you think we can go about this, Dr. Temir? We have to approach it in different ways. One of the things that we are missing in Nigeria is what she has said. Support from survivors is absolutely absent and is painful. You see, if somebody goes to hospital and they say you have cancer and you are depressed, you are hit by, in fact, a very, very big graded, blowing you apart. And somebody approaches you and says, let's sit down, let's talk. You know, I have this cancer also. I was diagnosed 10 years ago. I went this through the day. Immediately, most of your problems are solved. You know that, okay, when you get home, can you call me when you get home? When you feel depressed, come, let me talk with you. Let's pray together. Let's do this. Okay, I want to go for chemotherapy. They say it's bad. Yes, I went for chemotherapy. You may feel like vomiting. You may actually vomit. But we survive it. It's not the doctor telling you. It is someone who has gone through it. It makes a lot, a whole lot of difference. Mm. Mm. We lack that in Nigeria. And it made people to abandon treatment. Mm. And at the end of the day, we lose a lot of them. The day I see uh, the survivors supporting my patient, I'll be very, very, very glad. 90% of my problem will have been re re uh, removed. Cancelling and recancelling will not now be my, yes. my, my duties. The duty of those who have survived, or whose children have survived, will now come to you and talk to you and help you through treatment. They actually are present where you are taking your treatment. Now if equipment breaks down in Lagos, there's no reason why the government may not be working in Abuja. But and how many people it, will have the money for yeah. instance? Yeah. 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 There are two things that yeah. yeah. they are also yeah. going to get funding. They come together, they get donations, and they can support someone. Two, when they speak to government, the government listens better. Now, when we speak, when we speak, I, you, are my employer, you are my employee and you are talking to me. I, but somebody who is the citizen, who is going to vote into power, is speaking. Mm. 